Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a behind the scenes conversation with the creatives of Straight Line Crazy. It's my great honor to be here with you all this afternoon. Welcome to the shed. I'd like to welcome this wonderful team, and I'd like to begin by reading out some biogs. To my right, David Hare, the playwright of Straight Line Crazy. Yeah, let's clap that up. Let's clap that up. David is one of the UK's most internationally performed playwrights. 18 of his plays have been seen on and off Broadway, including Plenty, The Secret Rapture, Amy's View, Stuff Happens, The Vertical Hour, and the Tony Award-winning play Skylight. He has twice been nominated for Oscars for his screenplays The Hours and The Reader. In the last decade, he's written three original television series, The Warwicker Trilogy, which starred Bill Nighy, Collateral with Carrie Mulligan, and Roadkill with Hugh Laurie. In 1998, he was knighted for services to British Theatre. David here, everyone. <laughs> to David's right is Nicholas Heitner, who is the co-director of Straight Line Crazy and is a co-founder of the London Theatre Company and was the director of the National Theatre from 2003 to 2015. At the Bridge Theatre, he has directed Young Marks, Julius Caesar, Always, a, mid a Midsummer Night's Dream, Two Ladies, Beat the Devil, A Christmas Carol, Barkin' Sons, The Book of Dust, Nick has been busy. He was executive producer of the 2020 series of Alan Bennett's Talking Heads. His films include The Madness of King George, The History Boys, and The Lady in the Van. Nick has won three Olivier Awards, three Tony Awards, and a BAFTA. Nick Heitner. To the right of Nick is our co-director, Jamie Armitage. Jamie is the co-director of Six, the musical which is currently playing in London, New York, and is on tour in the UK and Australia right now. He's a resident director at the Almeida Theatre in London and was an artistic associate at the King's Head Theatre. His directing credits include Southern Bells, a Tennessee Williams double bill at the King's Head, Spring Awakening, Sweeney Todd, Spoonface, Richard II, Robin Hood, Henry IV, Part One, Jamie Armitage, everyone. <laughs> and finally, our guest that will join us in a short while, Mr. Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes plays the character of Robert Moses. Ray has enjoyed an extensive career acting in theater, film, and television, as well as producing and directing film. His last stage appearance was in T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets at the Pinter Theater which followed a national tour of the UK prior to that happening. Rafe has worked at The Bridge, in Beat the Devil by David Hare, directed by Nicholas Heitner. His many other theatre credits include Hamlet, Coriolanus, The Master Builder, God of Carnage, and Faith Healer. His many film credits include Schindler's List, The English Patient, The Constant Gardener, The Grand Budapest Hotel, and the roles of Lord Voldemort in the Harry Potter films, and M in Skyfall. He has also directed three feature films, The King's Man, The Dig, and Forgiven. Forthcoming films include The Menu and Wes Anderson's The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. Let's clap it up for Rafe. <laughs> I feel so insecure about myself right now, surrounded by these amazing human beings to my right, but I'm gonna live with that and fire away with the first question. My first question is to, to Nick, Nick Heitner, the impresario behind the show, behind the Bridge Theatre Company. Nick, tell us what first drew you to the character of Robert Moses. Uh, uh, some years ago, I read the Robert Caro biography uh, on uh, by a pool. You have to put quite a long, quite a, quite a few weeks aside to read it. <laughs> um, and it struck me that Robert Moses would be a wonderful subject for a play. And I've worked very happily with David before and thought that uh, as a character and as a subject it would appeal to David, which it did. The play, as it turned out, is not uh, based on uh, the Robert Caro book. And in fact, the second half of the play, which, uh, which uh, is focused on um, his failed attempt uh, to drive, um, to drive an, an expressway through Washington Square, uh, right through the park, uh, the, the um, antagonist in the second half, the celebrated uh, writer Jane Jacobs, uh, never even appears in the Caro biography, uh, 
I think it has emerged later that uh, that story was one of the many stories that he was obliged by his editor to cut because the book would have been even longer than the 1,200 pages than it already is. <laughs> so the book is a masterpiece. Uh, the play is something completely different. David uh, responded to the idea that Moses might be the subject of a play. Um, it was always, I think I'm right in saying, it was always our idea that when you'd written it, uh, it we would ask Rafe Fines to play Moses. That seemed to be a, a really useful catalyst for the writing of the play and a really good piece of casting. I can continue by saying Moses is not... Um, is not remotely a well-known uh, a well-known character uh, in Britain. Uh, to the London audience, uh, he was by and large completely new. Uh, it's daunting now and completely unexpected uh, to be here with a play about a man who was such a huge phenomenon in this city and so hugely influential in shaping this city. Um, for us, a British playwright, a British director, a British company of actors, to be here with a play about Robert Moses is roughly equivalent to an American company of actors, an American writer coming to London with a play about Winston Churchill. So, um, so we are daunted. <laughs> but just to lean into that for a second, Nick, so in London, how did you feel the audience responded? What were the themes of the work that seemed to resonate with audiences in London when Robert Moses, as you say, was such an unknown figure to so many? Yeah, so he is, he is uh, d d because he starts as a great idealist and the pursuit of power corrupts him, his dramatic arc has a universality about it which is, um, which is going to appeal to any audience anywhere. The specific subject of the play, um, the, um, the making and breaking of cities, um, the nature of uh, planning, um, habitation and transportation, that turned out to be absolutely fascinating to uh, the London audience, and we discovered a hitherto unknown large demographic um, completely neglected by the London theatre and I imagine the New, Lo New York theatre as well, which is town planners. Right. That <laughs> seriously, huge parties of planners came to the play and were completely thrilled to see the life that they lived represented in such, a, in such a dramatic and sometimes lurid fashion on the stage. So, but I think beyond the town planners, and I think there were thousands of them, because, it's, uh, because they, are, they are people who slave, un, slave away, unknown and unregarded by the rest of us, um, working at things which are actually absolutely vital to the way we live. Um, so they're a big deal. Um, apart from them, I think... Uh, the story of this extraordinary man and the influence he had on the way we live and the way we travel all over the world was very interesting to London. Thank you, Nick. To Jamie, when you first read the script, what immediately jumps out to you? What are you attracted by when you read the story of Robert Moses? I think I had this amazing feeling of disbelief that I never thought I would read a script about Robert Moses. So I was just so excited in that moment because I've been obsessed by Moses for years. And so I think when I first reached out to Nick, I was like, hey, I've got two very specific interests in life, theatre and Robert Moses. It feels like I could be useful on this project. Um, and I loved the play. I loved how complicated the questions it was asking were and how there's no easy answers to any of them. And I think the person who gave me the power broker the first time is a close friend. He works in transport and urban planning. And when he came, he loved it because he was like, it hasn't simplified what are such difficult questions, particularly around conservation. Like, it really draws attention at the end. of like, yes, conservation is a fantastic thing, but it can also lead to certain areas becoming completely elite because they're so beautiful and so refined that everyone else is priced out of it. And I think that's what I've really loved about working on this project is it's probing areas which are difficult, uncomfortable, and isn't trying to give an easy answer to them. It's just sort of making us think about it ourselves. Just to be clear, so you knew of Robert Moses before reading the play? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I knew about Robert Moses about uh, three years ago. My friend, <laughs> he's a transport consultant, um, he sort of thrusted this book into my hand. I was like, I'm not going to read this. And he was like, no, it's amazing, particularly as a study of power, particularly of, of a study of humanity. And so, um, yeah, it's, I think it's probably one of my desert island books. Like, I adore The Power Broker. Um, and so it felt like a natural choice to try and reach out to Nick and David about it. 
Thank you, Jamie. To David. David, so when Nick approaches you about this work, earlier this week, David here was very gracious in doing a workshop with some New York writers here. And if I can quote David, he said, Nick bullied him into writing this show. And I was curious, David. (laughs) But tell us, Robert Moses, um, for you, David, how does he speak to you? I think the important thing for me was to believe that I could write something which added to Caro, and that was, you know, if you read Caro, you know, there's no doubt he's the pioneer. You can't, get, you can't touch him. You can't go near him. He's the icebreaker. His research is incredible. I understand, and I've learned this week from somebody, that it's actually given now as a compulsory book to read before you study journalism at Columbia. I don't know if you knew this, but everybody who is going to study journalism at Columbia now has to read that book before they turn up, turn up in New York on the first day of term, because it is held up to be an exemplary piece of reporting. This, this is what you are going to do. You're going to report. And if you, if you report with diligence and an e- a high ethical standard and extraordinary command of your subject, you're going to aim to be like Robert Carra. So for me, the question was, how the hell do I write something which is not um, just in his wake um, because I can't, I didn't want to just dramatize his book. So I feel I've, I have a different view of Moses. Caro's book, as the title implies, is about power. Mm-hmm. And in particular, in great detail, about how this system whereby you throw a quarter or dime into a basket and that is collected on the bridges and on the, on the, as a toll on the roads went not to the city, but to his state commission. And so he was able to create what Caro calls a fourth arm of government and to be independent of democratic control. We think that decisions in society are taken by the people we elect in the public area, but here you have a man who for 40 years had a huge source of income which was coming back to him and enabling him to do exactly what he wanted in terms of bridges and roads and obviously to flatter his prejudices against mass transit. And so that's a book about power, and as you say, the corruption of power. My my play is not really about that. My play is about idealism. So I wanted to choose two incidents. One is obviously the creation of Jones Beach, which seems to me, as Moses himself in my play says, unarguable good. Here was this beautiful piece of land which the rich landowners and um, famous families of Long Island were forbidding access to. Moses gave them access with his roads. Um, But the dream he had of improving the lives of people who lived in the tenements was dependent on an instrument, and that instrument was the car that would travel along the roads. And he believed in the car as an instrument of liberation. 30 years later, in my second act, in when, when he's trying to drive an expressway through Washington Square, uh, then the car is seen, beginning to be seen very differently. You have these three women in mid-century um, America, you know, who all appear at the same time. Jane Jacobs publishes The Death and Life of American Cities in 1960. Uh, Rachel Carson writes Silent Spring in the mid-50s, and Kate Millett is pioneering obviously heavily influenced by Simone de Beauvoir, but she is pioneering a new wave of American feminism. And so you have at the same time this extraordinary phenomenon of these three women all dealing with subjects which have always been held, have always been controlled by what we we would now call the male patriarchy. And suddenly women are talking about these subjects in a completely different way from the way men have talked about them. And so for me, the tragedy of uh, Caro is he's a man who's trapped in a dream. And what begins as a great dream of liberation becomes, in fact, a nightmare of oppression. And yet it's the same dream. And it's his failure to modify and to adapt. This seems to me a universal theme. I am trapped in the dreams of my youth, speaking personally. And I can't adapt them. And it's a failing in me. And I think it's a failing in all sorts of people that they feel that whatever they set out to do, they've not been able to come to terms with the effect of reality on what they set out to do. 
And so for me, it's, 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 it's a story of personal tragedy. And you might say that in that way, I see Moses in a rather more colored, more complicated way, perhaps, than Caro, who plainly set out to write about him and grew to dislike him heartily as, as he wrote. I, I, I don't dislike him as heartily as Caro does, though I do not in any way diminish or gloss over his crimes, uh, the greatest of which was obviously the Cross Bronx Expressway, which is unforgivable and for which people still haven't forgiven him quite rightly. David, if I may, just to invite you to lean into, what was the process of research for you? So what did that take? Who did you speak with? How long did you give yourself before you started to commit to writing the script? Visiting Jones Beach. Um, <laughs> loads of books, loads of films. Um, there's a whole literature that's grown up in Caro's wake, and there is also a massive literature surrounding Jane Jacobs. What, in your opinion, were Moses' greatest attributes? What did you feel, what were his greatest attributes for Moses? What do you think the city should, as well as the Cross Bronx, as well as the things that he had done that clearly um, go against him, what should the city remember of Moses? What are the positives that you think the city ha owes to Robert Moses? Well, I think it's paradoxical. I think he <laughs> genuinely did want to give people a better life. And he did think that life in the tenements and life for the working class in Manhattan, in the New York boroughs, was horrible, and that in order to give people holidays and to give people hiking and to give them fresh air and to give them beaches and to give them swimming pools and to give them playgrounds and to give them green spaces was the, the mission of his life right. originally. However, the means that he used to do that became oppressive to people. Mm -hmm. And he became so scratchy with criticism. You know, if you are an urban planner, you are criticized all the time. It is, it, it's far worse than being a playwright. It, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it is constant wall of criticism. And of course, you either become, you know, you, you become desensitized. And Moses, unfortunately, started by saying, I was right originally when I took on the landowners of Long Island, therefore I am right for the next 40 years. And so what started out as a, an energy and a vitality became a high-handedness which oppressed people. And there was undoubtedly a racist element to that, which right. I hope the play makes clear. Yeah, and I think for those who haven't seen the play, I think this is what the play does so expertly. These two halves of the play, this rise and fall story, I think, especially in the second half, one really questions what is motivating Moses in the decisions he's making. Let me just pause a moment, invite Ray Fiennes to come and take a seat and join us here. It's great to have you, Rafe. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we were just talking, Rafe, about um, researching the play and what David had done to research the work. But I would love to just hand over to Nick for a second. What was the research for you, as well as Caro? When you knew that this work was happening, what did you lean into? How did you build up a bigger picture of Robert Moses the man? Caro is a pretty big picture. <laughs> but you put Robert Moses into YouTube, my gosh, there's a lot of stuff there. Wow. So, uh, so it was Caro and YouTube. Wow. Um, but, uh, and... Um, uh, it, there was a gap, obviously, between me suggesting the idea to David and the, uh, and the play arriving, uh, <laughs> during which David did most of the work. Right. <laughs> um, I'm familiar with the city. I spent a lot of time in the city, and so, um, uh, so uh, much of the specific detail, particularly in the second half, which went over the head of London audiences, never went over my head. It's been very exciting, the performances we've done so far here, to be playing to an audience which knows in precise detail exactly what's being talked about in the second half. Because the second half, um, uh, if, if, if you were unfairly to characterize it, is about um, traffic management in downtown Manhattan. <laughs> that's um, right. Uh, that's, um, that, it, it, it comes alive here because... Um, because, you know, um, 
when he talks about hopeless congestion on 8th Street, everybody knows what he's talking about. That's so, wow. So the, the, uh, the research the, here, to a large extent, the research is provided by the audience. Uh, it was exciting, incidentally, um, in uh, the recent West Side Story remake, the very opening shot, I don't know if you, uh, if you saw it or remember it, the very opening shot is a wrecking ball um, smashing through uh, tenements uh, on the west side and the camera coming to rest on a big billboard which, um, which announces the building of Lincoln Center for the Arts. Uh, that's always what West Side Story was about, tenements uh, that had been condemned by Robert Moses uh, in order to build um, an arts complex, which I'm sure you are all regular attenders of. <laughs> Lives were destroyed by Robert Moses so that you could go to the Met feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> wow. um, and to you, Jamie, as well as having clearly been a fan of Robert Moses before the play was written, but once the script arrives, what are you look how are you meeting the reality of New York? What is the research look like for you? I think some of my favourite bits was watching Moses' videos of him talking and doing interviews, because he would go out there and sort of defend his plans in quite vehement ways. And the best is when, I mean, it's in the mid-70s, so he's kind of out of power by this point. He's in his 80s. And he is, he was such a big, powerful man in life, but by this time he's quite, he's, he's shrunk. But he's still got this vitality, he's still incredibly intelligent, and he still believes there should be massive expressways cutting across Manhattan. And even though that plan is pretty much dead, he's still like, it's going to happen one day, it's got to take place. And it's astonishing to see that even once he's lost power, even though he no longer has the privilege of authority, he's still still believes that he was right. He still believes that we should smash down wow. three big lines through the middle of Manhattan to build enormous roads. Wow. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Rafe, if I may, just um, a question in two parts for you, please. Firstly, what's attracted you to this role of Robert Moses? And secondly, what was your research as the performer that would lead this production? Uh, well, I, I had not heard of Moses when uh, David said that he had spoken to Nick about the idea for a play about a particular man, and they kept it secret for a little bit, and then they I received the play, read it uh, in tandem, I think. Maybe I think, no, you said to me, we're doing a play about a man called Robert Moses. He did this and this and this. And then, of course, the first thing I did was read The Power Broker, and then shortly after that, I started, read the, I received the first draft of the play. And uh, the first thing I felt was that it was very, it was a, the play thematically in terms of this strident, strong male figure who uh, has a great conviction in his own will, his own sense of beliefs, was a cousin to a play, an Ibsen play that David adapted, of the, the Master Builder, a few years ago. And it, I felt there were themes of these strong, dominant males who, who uh, are building and making and without any compromise. And in the end, they're not necessarily attractive, but they're compelling dramatic figures. And I think that sort of Ibsen-esque mm -hmm. vibe in terms of the role was appealing to me. Um, and then, of course, with that, all the ideas that you've just been talking about. But um, the, the preparation really was, was what, what, what Jamie's just been saying. Uh, the first thing as an actor, you think, what does he sound like? What did he look like? What was he? So the first thing to do was to get recordings of his voice, of which there are quite a few. And there's some footage of him on television in, the, I think, late 50s. And then the very the interesting one, 1977, when he must be 88 or 89, he's still very lucid, and he's talking to a young man from a te television channel who's saying, you know, you failed, Mr. Moses, on a few things. No, I didn't fail. No, we, we're going to still do these things. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there's a very funny uh, excerpt from the interview where... The young man says to him, but, you know, you want to build this expressway? You wanted to build this expressway through the Murray Hill area? He said, no, we're not talking about Murray Hill. We're not talking about that. There's no, there's no neighborhood there, he says. Wow. And, uh, and, and the guy says, well, I, I have friends there. We're not going to build this because of your friend? <laughs> <laughs> What's extraordinary about uh, Rafe's performance is the two halves of the play, like the physicality that you embody in the first half and then the aging of Robert Moses, the 30 years between into the second act. But Rafe, in terms of the physicality, like did the research reveal any sort of grammar in his well, body language that you adopted? Well, no, well, there isn't 
there's a bit of footage of him I've seen walking. He's very, he was a very tall man, much taller than me. He was like six foot two, I think. Very broad, a swimmer, as we know it from the play. You know, his passion was swimming. He was a strong swimmer, in op an open water swimmer, swimming long distances in the sea. A very powerful man. Uh, Caro's descriptions of him from his research, a terrible, frightening temper. Um, could be very charming, incredibly clever, very articulate. His, his language, his use of English was impressive. Um, so a highly educated, intelligent, powerfully built man with the capacity for terrifying red rage. Um, the footage I've seen is he holds himself very powerfully, very tall, very erect. Um, and there's one great clip that David sent me on a documentary about Joe Papp where Moses wanted to charge people to see Shakespeare in the park, and in this interview, he leans forward and he kind of snarls his, his view that people should pay. And that, that's one little, it was a fantastic clip, because most of the interviews, he's kind of pompous and holding forth and being lucid, and this one thing, you just see this thing coming out. Wow. And Moses, uh, Caro remembers some people saying, some people Caro interviewed, about Moses, who had worked with him, one of these guys said, I don't even want to talk about the anger. It was so terrifying. Wow. So um, I try to suggest that's in the play to be played. Um, and the rest, of course, actors, you know, when you're playing a real person, you, of course, want to get as much physical, um, emotional detail that's there. But in the end, of course, you bring your own instincts and creative intuition to it with the words you're given and the direction you're given. So it's a kind of, you're working on a number of, in, sort of inputs, if you like, so. Thank you so much, Ray. For those who haven't see, had an opportunity to see the show already, it's breathtaking what we see um, Ray do on stage and an amazing company of performers as well. Super excited for everyone to see it. I just want to pivot back to Jamie and Nick for just a moment. The stage design for this show, it's not a naturalistic set. It would be great just to talk, Nick, for a moment about Jamie, about how the design for the set was arrived at. What were the conversations? Were there um, ideas that you had? Just describe to us how you arrived at the scenic design. I think I should probably take that because J Jamie came on, a, came on a bit later. Um, I've worked with the designer, Bob Crowley, many times before. Uh, the first, thing, the first thing we decided, the first thing we talked about e before we even started was what it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. It's very, very easy when you're taking a historical subject where there's plenty of photographic and video uh, archive um, of what the world of the play looked like. It's very easy uh, to decide, particularly these days, to go down that route. Uh, we could... We could easily be, although the play is actually tightly constructed um, and uh, demands uh, a modest number of milieu, because in the first half there is so much talk about the topography of Long Island, about Jones Beach, um, about, and in the second half we're talking about um, Manhattan, 1955, about um, projects that have already been completed. Terrifying photographs uh, and video exists of the destruction of the Bronx. Um, m terrific archive material exists about what would have happened to Washington Square if he'd managed uh, to drive his expressway through it. What would have happened to Soho um, if the Crosstown Expressway um, uh, between um, Broome and Grand had happened? We, we could have done that. But we thought immediately, it's not that play. Mm. It's a play It's a play where it's really important that the audience is pulled in to the specific characters, their specific ideas, the things they say to each other. It is unashamedly talky. It's a play. <laughs> um, so let's, let's not make it... Um, a staged documentary. There is certainly a place for that. It's not a documentary. There, is, there are documentaries available. So uh, we wanted the kind of arena that would work best um, for a play that, 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 that would focus attention on the people and the people and, and what these people are saying. So we, we wanted a, an abstract space and it was the designer's idea, Bob Crowley's idea, 
that this, the neutrality of the space should draw on um, the material of architects' offices, planners' offices, drawing boards. So you get a um, very simple plywood box with, um, with nothing other within it uh, than um, drawing boards and, um, and, uh, and drawing tables. Uh, wow. So it's that. Yeah, it's an extraordinary design in our space. It's the first time we've had a show that's in thrust in our space. And I think well, we do a lot in thrust. We do. We, I mean, it's it, mm -hmm. we the the the, the theatre that uh, that my colleague and Nick, Nick Starr and I built uh, after we left the National Theatre is entirely flexible, exactly. and the thrust format is the one that over the years we, we opened in twenty seventeen. Uh, two years of that, obviously, uh, were tricky. <laughs> um, so, we, so I can't say we've been actually going five years, but that thrust format, for what it's worth, is our favourite. Nick, let me just pivot into another question with you. So you've, we've, we're in preview four tonight, I think, uh, for the show here in New York. That experience of the two audiences, the proximity of this audience, like what, how has it changed? How is it different uh, from London to New York? Jamie. Totally. Um, I think the thing that is a thrill is that they, because of the format, because of the design, they are as engaged, they are as a part of the space, and I think that's what pulls people in. Um, and it's kind of what Nick was talking about earlier. Like, you can feel that specificity. The second act does feel different. I think first act is similar. Like, it's fun. There's these amazing characters. It's exciting, all the idealism. And the second act, because it's so specific to where either you live there or you spend a lot of your days there, that destruction feels like a threat that is a lot more mm. tangible to a New York audience than I think in London. They loved it, but it was not as clear exactly what it meant to stick a, you know, an expressway between Broom Street and Grand, for instance. But obviously here you know exactly what that means and all the destruction that would cause. And so I think feeling that focus in the second half has been the most exciting difference since being here. So to David, so we, we're at preview four today. For yourself, this relationship to the audience, what, what have you heard? What have you picked up? What surprised you with our audiences here in New York? Um, I was expecting everybody to have heard of Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a little disappointed. <laughs> okay, the only reflection you have. <laughs> that's the I, I, I can see that we're in the 21st century and that, you know, we're, that I am very old. And that, uh, you know, so the trigger words like Eleanor Roosevelt uh, mean a lot to me, but they don't necessarily mean so much to the next generation. And that's why I hope the play both explains um, what's going on to those who know nothing about the subject without insulting those who do know something right. about the subject. But the, clearly there's a mix, isn't there, in the audience, I, you know, People I've talked to, you know, there's, there's somebody I know who's been twice already because they are a Moses fanatic, you know, a, 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 a Mosesologist or whatever you call it. And, you know, who will come again, she said, in about 10 days' time. She'll be making her third visit because they are collectors of Moses stuff. Mm. Um, and then there are other people who clearly are, you know, surprisingly... Don't know. I mean, I, I should add, by the way, that at the end of the 1970s, I lived on Broadway between Broome and Grand. And I had absolutely no idea that the uh, loft that I lived in that year would not have existed. Should have it, been torn down. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going, I was, I was a little disappointed. I was disappointed. This was, Disappointed that the laughs we thought were there on Eleanor Roosevelt are not heartier than they are. But then I realized that if you gave a London audience a series of jokes about Clementine Churchill, yeah. you would be, you would be <laughs> met with an equal wall of incomprehension. That's what I'm saying. It's generational. Yeah, it is. Yeah. If I may, to, to Rafe, just a couple of questions to Rafe and we'll open it up here. But to Rafe, has there been a difference? Like, have you felt a different energy from the audience to the stage? What's your feeling of being performing here in New York? I feel there's an intense quality of listening and focus. Mm -hmm. um, we have the same laughter in the same places pretty much, although there's a little bit more, I wouldn't say laughter of funny ha-ha, but laughter of recognition mm. when, when I have speeches about the city and the problems in right. the city. 
But I feel there's a real focus, a real, a real strong sense of listening. But yeah, that's what I think. If, just a follow-up question. Um, for you as a performer here in New York and for all of us here that are regular attendees of um, performances here in New York, we will all recognize that many of our shows, the performers are mic'd, right? We will see this as kind of just the grammar of making theater here in New York. More often than not, they're mic'd. Our performers in this production are not mic'd. This is not mic'd. And Rafe, for yourself, the importance of not being mic'd. Why is this? Yeah, this is something that I think is important to you. Well, it, it is. I mean, I, I've been in productions at the National Theatre recently where we were mic'd, not be because of a soundscape that's happening whereby we would not be heard if, unless we were mic'd. I, I guess my background, my training is in that you should be able to reach the back row of a, a thousand seat theatre. Um, I spent a lot of my early um, sort of formative years in the theatre, the, 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 the um, Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford-on-Avon, which was then a different, a different building than it is now. It was a very difficult house, but it had seen great Shakespeare productions for 30 or 40, or longer than that. And you know, productions that I, growing up, wanting to be in Shakespeare plays, these were productions that had been historically recognized. The Wars of the Roses with Peggy Ashcroft in the 60s was stuff I grew up not even seeing, but just they were there, like these great epic things that had occurred. These were actors who could be heard in an a, thou a thousand seater, hmm. with no mics. And so I do think that the slow, creepy crawly of mics being put on actors is, is wearing down the acting vocal skill because it is a muscular, athletic skill you have to have. It's diction, it's, all this is working like an, like an athlete and seemingly effortlessly. And that skill is being compromised because of mics. Now, I, uh, and that's what I think. So wherever we can do without mics, it's a good thing. Um, but we, we actors, we need to be able to know that we have to have that equipment functioning. Um, I don't know what the current state of voice training is now in, in drama schools, I don't know. But when I was at drama school in the early 80s, we were, we, it was assumed we would be w working in theaters with no microphones, and that was the training that we had. Uh, I'll just briefly pick up on that, because I, I agree with you. I'm not doctrinaire. I have done, uh, to quote the play, I've done shows where the actors have been mic'd. But what happens when an actor isn't mic'd is not just about voice. It's about a form of physical communication, mm. which necessarily has to take in the 500, 800, 1,000 or so people in the house. And it is a fallacy that a conversation on stage is just a conversation between the actors. The conversation always has to include everybody else who's in the room where it happens. Yeah, and, the, and once it's mic'd, yeah. the temptation is to exclude the 800 or so people who are watching you. Hmm. They become mere spectators, not participants. Yeah. Mm. And I think that, that's, that's the thing that, that... And so even when you are mic'd, um, I think bearing in mind that it's a three-way conversation, not a two-way conversation, yeah. is probably what you have to do. Yeah. I also think one, an old actor once said to me, the eye goes before the ear. So part of your being understood is that you are physically, you're aware of your physical connection, your face, how it's seen or not seen. So there are things that you find yourself doing to, and obviously there's a dangerous area of pulling focus when you're with someone else's. But I think, I think there's a whole package of expression as well as voice, which is part of communicating. And it adds to, I think if you see someone wanting to communicate with you by the way they are just physically, you lean into them. Mm -hmm. And if you lean in, you will hear them. So of course you should, I mean, the, it's possible to speak quietly in a big theater if you've got the right kind of silence. Um, but I think it's, it's a whole package, as Nick's saying, of expression. Love that, beautiful. Um, you guys are up. It's time. We are going to please raise your hand and one of our colleagues will come around and give you a mic. So we just have a question. So this is the first hand I saw, um, the gentleman in the green shirt. We'll just bring a mic up to you now. Thank you, Daisy. So just up here, thank you. I, I know you can. We just need the mic just to capture it on the cameras. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
So we know that a lot of Robert Moses' success was due to the way he wielded power. You show that so well. It was sometimes brutal as it went on. And we see the effects on the ground all around us in the New York region. What do you think the way he wielded power, I guess this is for David, did to him personally? What did it do to him over time? Well, it's speculative, isn't it? Uh, because his defenses were in such good order, you know, the, de the kind of defenses that Rafe is talking about. But that's why I invented two fictional characters who grow old with him. Apart from anything, I wanted this to be a passage of time play. Mm -hmm. So it's about a group of people who work together. Um, you know, as somebody said to me yesterday, no sex in this play at all. Absolutely <laughs> none. You know, it's about, it's about offices, you know? Not that there isn't sex in offices, but, you know, that, that, it, that it is about this group of people. It's not sexual. It's three intimate relationships, and it's about how they all change. My speculative version, and it's a fiction, you know, is that, you know, he became more and more incapable of communicating genuine emotion, or, you know, which Rafe plays absolutely brilliantly. You know, we can't bear to be interrogated about his wife being committed to the Payne Whitney Asylum. You know, he can't bear it when, when you know, Fanula begins to talk in terms that imply the some kind of um, debt owed by the hundred years of work that they've done, the three of them together, three, it adds up to a hundred years. So I'm showing a man who's become completely isolated. Would that be fair to say, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And so, but it's speculative. You know, my, my, my play is a fiction and it's a funny mix of fiction, which is why I'm so happy with what Nick's saying about the design that it wasn't designed as a documentary. We're not doing documentary theatre at all. We're doing Ibsen, or we're doing a play in the Ibsen tradition, in which I happen to take a man who's extremely well known, uh, but I interpret what I think happened to him. Whether I'm right or not, um, you know, the, Mo the Mosesologists will have to just a, argue about. But just a no follow-up to that, David. So just talk to us about the character of Mariah, such a significant character in the second half of the play. Who is she based on? Tell us how you found the character of Mariah. I've forgotten the name of the first black American woman Norma Skrellick. architect. Norma Skrellick. Yeah. So there is a figure at that period who actually maintains a career from the 1950s onwards and who actually existed and who did have a, an architectural practice of her own eventually, which was incredibly difficult to do, as you can imagine, at the time. But most of all, I wanted somebody who brought onto the stage what had been done in um, the Cross Bronx Expressway. When I was choosing the two incidents, then obviously the other choice to have made was the Cross Bronx Expressway mm -hmm. um, in terms of the second act. And I could have written a second act about the Cross Bronx Expressway. But my feeling was that I wanted to write about something where Moses was defeated rather than where Moses was successful. And I also wanted to write about the rise of a middle-class movement. And, you know, the, everyone, particularly Shirley Hayes, and Shirley Hayes' family are coming to see the play. Her sons are coming to see the play. Um, and Shirley Hayes, you know, had watched the people in the Bronx not be listened to. And basically, they were not listened to. They, it was not through a failure of organization. It was to do with the color of their skin that they were not listened to and they organized unsuccessfully to stop the Bronx, the damage done in the Bronx. Then you have a group of middle class people and intellectuals, the New York, one of the people on the stage is meant to be the New Yorker architectural critic. <laughs> you know, the, these are the kind of people this, this movement attracted and you know, th they are successful. And this is the beginning of the um, not in my backyard movement that, uh, that begins in the 1950s and, you know, come, come, you know, which is why there's the attack by Moses on the principle of conservation. Um, but I hope I make it clear that it's a complicated question and a particularly complicated politically. In other words, a lot of the people who are in the Washington Square movement were not liberals. They were Goldwater conservatives. They were people who felt that everything the government did was bad and everything that was imposed from above was bad, and that everything people did for themselves was good. 
And Jane Jacobs is as much a heroine to the right as she is to the left. And so you had a, an alliance, as I hope the play makes clear, of people of all sorts of different political views fighting Moses. Thank you, David. Why don't we take a cut? We'll take three questions. We'll hear the questions, and then we will respond to them. So Daisy will just come around with the mic. Daisy, thank you. We've just got a question in the back there. Thank you, Daisy. So we'll take a group of three questions, and then we'll invite yes, the panel to uh, answer them shortly. I, I really, really love the uh, choice of the Jones Beach in Washington Square. I thought they were just absolutely perfect for it. I'm wondering, in the writing of the play, did you work your way through a short list to get there, or re did they kind of jump out at you and immediately? So, if we, David, before you answer, if we just take a couple more questions, we'll take a group of questions and we'll put them to the... So that was the question for David. We'll remember that. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy, for doing this. Thank you for your patience in the audience. Hi, so we have a row of urban planners here, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for calling out our profession, I appreciate it. Um, I'm fascinated by bureaucracy, and I'm actually writing an article about the tensions in bureaucracy between surplus and scarcity, between protocol and improvisation, Mm -hmm. and the like, and I haven't seen the play yet. I'm coming in December, and I was wondering if you could speak to the ways bureaucracy shows up in the play, either in the writing or the set design or, or anywhere else. Fantastic question. We'll take one more, and then we'll invite the panel to respond. Thank you. Hi, friend. Here we go. Thank you. I'm going to sneak in, too. Okay. Uh, did you speak <laughs> to or have you heard from Robert Caro? Uh, is one. And number two is, were you apprehensive about opening such an incredibly New York-centric play in London? Perfect. David, why don't you kick us Shall off, I please? Go Thank you. go backwards through the questions? All right. If, if anyone else would like to take one of these questions, I would be very <laughs> happy. Um, the the, the um, New Yorker theatre critic, John Law, once wrote that there was never a British play in which an American was not represented as vulgar and stupid, and that all British playwrights condescend to Americans in the way they represent them. I was deeply insulted by this, because I wrote The Vertical R, I wrote um, uh, Stuff Happens. I do not feel that, I, 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 took, I took it very personally, and I just think that John Law is talking out of his hat. Um, you know, I, that's what playwrights do. They talk about, they write about people who are not like themselves. Am I frightened? Of course. How could I not be? Uh, but, you know, the question is simply, why has no American playwright ever dealt with this subject? I, I have no idea of the answer to that question. Uh, what was the other one? Well, I'd, I'd also say there's no shortage of plays on the British stage, hugely successful British plays, uh, set in or even subject about New York City. Um, we love them. From West Side Story and Guys and Dolls through to the entire oeuvre of Clifford Odets and um, a large amount of Arthur Miller. Um, yeah, no, it, that, 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 what, that's, that's not a problem. Um, uh, we all, you know, we all wish we lived here. So. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you speak to Robert Carroll? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't spoken to Robert Carroll. Uh, really, you know, I feel I'm a pipsqueak in his wake. Um, I've seen a movie about Robert Caro, uh, which was shown, uh, which is just about to be shown. Sony Classics are about to release it, about his relationship with his editor, Robert Gottlieb, um, and about um, how Gottlieb edits his books. And because I, um, it is made by Robert Gottlieb's daughter, rather than Robert Caro's daughter, it has an emphasis with which perhaps I don't entirely agree. Uh, <laughs> So there's it, a question it, it about... It seems to imply the editor was crucial in the book. Rafe. I'm concerned we haven't answered... Yeah, exactly, yeah. We, we have a question about bureaucracy and a question about how we arrived at the Jones Beach the context. You go. No, the, 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 the gentleman... <laughs> that was yours. I'm working backwards. <laughs> the, 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 I could, the bureaucracy question... question. <laughs> the bureaucracy question, I think you'll see when you see the play that... Um, I don't know whether you will... Uh, there's a line right at the end of the play uh, where um, the character based on Norma Skerritt 
says later, after she's worked for Moses, she's at endless planning meetings over the years, and someone says, what this city needs is a strong man to take it in charge, to take, to take, it in, to take charge of it. And she thinks, mm, yeah, maybe. But um, the point about his character is he cuts through bureaucracy, for better, for worse. Uh, he, I suspect... I mean, I don't know. I mean, let's say, um, it, it's, it was a demographic we were thrilled. It was a group we were thrilled to welcome in London Urban Planners. Um, you might find yourselves wishing you had his ability to cut through the bureaucracy, <laughs> or you might come away thinking that there is a point to the bureaucracy after all. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, the, there's a very terrifying uh, opinion poll recently in the 18 to 35 group in the UK, 60% of them said that they thought it would be better if a strong person were given total control of the country rather than democracy. And that is a 60% in the 18 to 35 year old group. So that really is what this play is about. It's about the strong man taking control. Yeah. Luckily for us, when we get a strong man, it's Boris Johnson. <laughs> Who is a, who, who, were he to return, can you believe this is on the cards? Were he to return, he would be a clown still. <laughs> and just, David, if you may, to our first question about Jones Beach and the research, right? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, it, it just seemed, um, I, Jones Beach was just, I, I just wanted to show that he began as an idealist. And I, you know, there just seemed to me a wonderful chance to express what was great about Moses. And so to throw the prejudice of the audience off, you know, he's represented in a film called Motherless Brooklyn, directed by Ed Norton. He's given another name, but he's Robert Moses. And in that, he's represented almost as a mafia boss. You know, he's talking to mobsters in the, in the film and implying that he got people killed. And the, the reputation that he has by people who dislike him is so wrong. It, you know, you, you may be right to dislike him for what he did, but don't misrepresent who he was. Mm -hmm. And who he was was a radical of a kind at the beginning who had indeed been snared up in bureaucracy, as you say. He spent 10 years trying to reform the New York Civil Service and was incredibly frustrated. And as a result of trying to reform the Civil Service, wanted power in order to be able to impose himself. And then the choice of the second subject, well, I am in, still in two minds about it, but it's too late. In other <laughs> words, I, I, you know, I, I, one part of me re regrets not doing the Cross Bronx Expressway, uh, but it would, not, it would have been a different play. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take three more questions from the audience. Daisy's going to come around. Please put your hands up here. In, did you have a question here in the front? Yeah, Daisy, thank you so much. So we're just, Daisy's just going to go to... I can be, I can be <laughs> We just need the mic so we can catch your question for the film. Thank you. Thanks, Daisy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one thing I want to just mention, the Power Broker book was given to me by the head of the MIT architecture department, which I think is amazing. So you do, this book is everywhere. It's amazing. And we're so excited to see the play. We have not seen it yet. Many of us are involved with Central Park. So we talk about Robert Moses in a love-hate relationship because obviously he was a lot of things he tried to do at Central Park that we're grateful that he did not get away with. And, uh, but also he put the playgrounds in Central Park, which we helps us raise money for Central Park, which is a not-for-profit organization. So it's pretty amazing. So when we talk about Moses, uh, we're kind of Olmsted geeks, but uh, we love Robert Moses as well with the love-hate. Um, my question was, sorry, uh, <laughs> um, with the two parts, the Jones Beach, and the, the, do you go back and forth between the, you know, do you bring it up again in the, like all the positive that he did when you're talking about the negative? Or do you, like, you, do, is it just switch? Like, does he get to be, you know, does, does Robert Moses come out and say, like, keep bringing up all the good he does when he, they were talking about the bad? Or is it just good and bad? Uh, yes, in the, road, the section where we mentioned Eleanor, where David mentions Eleanor Roosevelt wanting to close Washington Square, I have a speech saying, I know I've, I've doubled the green space in New York City to 35,000 acres. I've added zoos, recreation centers, 
ball fields, 17 miles of beach, and 658 playgrounds. I won't say the next bit, that might offend people. <laughs> Great question, thanks. Do we have a question over here? Oh, perfect. Of the course. microphone's right okay. here. Well, right here. Was there right a question here. at the back that we'll come to in just a moment? Thank you. What mo I have two questions. Um, what modifications were made to the play from when it came, came across the pond? Um, and then this is fascinating to me, the no microphone thing. So how do you pull off me in the back row, a thousand people, and Aileen here in the front row, and not feel like you're yelling at her when you're performing to get across that noise, volume? Changes to the play, and how does Rafe manage you to always, if You always, if you have first-rate actors, you change plays. You know, the fun for me, I love being in the rehearsal room. You know, Nick Heitner will look at me. We've worked together a lot. Jamie will look at me. And uh, he'll, he'll just, you know from their look, they're saying, is that line really necessary? <laughs> you, you know, Nick, Nick, now doesn't, Nick now doesn't need to say it. The, the line on which I constructed the entire play... A week before we opened in London, he looked at me and said, I know this is going to hurt you, but, you know, can we cut that line? And I, I said, not at all. It's the scaffolding with which I built the play. And now the play exists, the scaffolding can fall away. And that, you know, that's, that to me is the joy of... That's why I'm in the collaborative arts. I'm in the collaborative arts. Not, I'm not a novelist. I'm not... Well, I'm trying to be a poet, but it's a little late. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm not working alone in a garret. I love the rehearsal room and I love the discoveries of the rehearsal room from the actors and directors, you know. That's the fun of being a playwright. David, could you tell us, and we'll come to Rafe to answer the second question, but Rafe, uh, forgive me, David, could you tell us about the Viola Davis rewrites? Yeah, I can. Would you like um, <laughs> What? Yeah, I think that it became important when we came to New York to make sure that the character on the stage who had um, direct experience of the effect of the um, Cross Bronx Expressway um, came from the ethnic group that had suffered from it. And so that I slightly rejigged as we came to New York. And I think the play is stronger for it. Absolutely, yeah. it is. It's an amazing second half. We're going to take this... Uh, sorry, Rafe, to you first, and then we'll take this question. Well, I think if you sit closer to the stage in a thousand-seater, you're going to definitely feel the effort, the volume, the sweat, the spit. <laughs> you're going to get that. Um, and I think there's a sweet spot, which is probably eight to ten rows back where you hear it but you're not given a shower. <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then at the back, uh, yeah, hopefully you... I, I remember seeing Alan Howard, great Shakespearean actor, play Richard II at the Aldwych Theatre in London. I must have been about 16. And he, Richard II has the most beautiful but challenging, stunning monologue at the end, just before his death. And I could hear every word and I can, I, I, I can see now leaning down and being taken into this beautiful monologue and it stayed with me for the rest of my life and and I, I and the sense of close or distant I was just taken into this world of the, the speech I didn't even compute that I was up high and he was far away I just went right right, right inside it. thank you Rafe and to our final question for the day thank you <laughs> I think you kind of touched on some of what I was going to ask. I did see the play, amazing job. I didn't even know it was a mic. Like, it's amazing. Um, what stuck out to me was the moments where the Bronx Expressway were mentioned. I wanted to know, like, how did you make the decisions on how you would address that matter? And Mr. Vines went through a lot of, like, different expressions silently through that time that were communicated a lot. So I wanted to also know how you made some of the character and the trait decisions on how you were going to communicate some of those feelings. Um, and you did already say, David, that you added more, I guess, to that section when it was coming to New York. You know, Jamie already mentioned that um, some of the references weren't caught. Were those one of the references that the audience outside of New York were able to like pick up on nuances about or 
relate to, I guess, with like Windrush and certain things. Um, well, I, it, uh, yeah, I think bringing it here where you've driven on the Cross Bronx Expressway, where you know what was destroyed to make this horrible road. Um, and you know, you know how, um, how destructive and casually, casually racist the decisions were that went into the construction of that road. It was obviously important, I think we all thought, to bring that more vividly and viscerally alive. And I think it is one of the, it is one of the um, unanswerable charges against him. Although he defends himself against it, um, his, his poli he, the, the, what he demolished and destroyed, there was a, essentially racist motivation to it. Um, he didn't destroy the Upper East Side, you know? Uh, so I think and th these things are harder to get across to an audience that hasn't got a vivid image of a New York in front of it. So it was, it was, I think we all thought that coming here, we had an opportunity to land these things um, more comprehensively. I think one of the things I love about the structure of the play, which we've been talking about a lot, is how it's, with this question of the need for a strong person to take a hand on an issue, the play kind of explores that with this kind of temptation narrative of like the first half, you see the idealized version of that, someone who's charismatic, charming, fighting the good fight. Yeah, he's ignoring some of the rules, but it's against the aristocrats, so that's a good fight. And okay, maybe he said a few questionable things there about not including everyone, but it's fine because it's a good thing. And but all the flaws that become manifest in the second half are there in the first half, just in a small way, which you kind of, you don't notice or you brush off, like some of the characters do, like Fanula, who's an essential character for understanding Moses through her eyes. She brushes some things aside or she kind of hears it but doesn't want to speak. And yet those things then come to their full scary form in the second half where you're like, okay, that's what happens when that kind of ambition and behavior is unchecked. But I think what was so good about the changes made coming from here was strengthening up some of Moses's counter arguments so it didn't just feel like the show piled in on him and he didn't defend himself. He didn't just accept the accusations of prejudice. Because even though that's a thing which most people know about him and will say about him, he obviously did not believe that about himself. And you know whether or not you believe him when he says, um, I knocked down the worst houses, the people who live there, their color makes no difference to me. I did it because of this reason. Whether you believe that or not, he still, for his own narrative, had to think that he was doing it for reasons other than prejudice, even though we can look at the evidence, we can see where these projects were, and the cumulative effect of that does suggest that he was... And we can see issues. that he did nothing for public transportation and deliberately made it impossible for people who didn't own their own cars to go to, to, go to all these glorious playgrounds and state parks that he wrote. He did that deliberately. So it's so... I, when, when we talked about research, I was very, very, very struck by James Baldwin saying, when I hear the words urban renewal, I know what it means. It means Negro remo removal, is what he said. And that, and you know, Baldwin is so onto that and onto it so fast and understands it so fast. Um, and he's, you know, he, as a voice from that period, he's absolutely extraordinary. And during my research, you, it, it was Baldwin over and over you go back to, and you, it, you, just to hear him speak about what's going on around him is fantastic, you know. And you're, before you communicated even, or like, you know, um, responded to some of those accusations, you were already going through like a range of thoughts and stuff. And I could see that. Um, and just wanted to know more about your approach to, I don't know, embodying the character and their response to some of well, those accusations. I think that you have to be full of you're, you're a living, breathing human being all the time, not just when you're speaking. So when you're receiving someone else's lines, dialogue, accusations, you're listening and you're, in Moses' case, maybe you're closing down, but you're, you're, so I think you tell a story as an actor 
all the time. Um, and you go on learning what it is. Every night I do the show, it's a different thing, subtly. I, I, have, I think we all, all actors would say we have to be present and fresh in the moment. But by doing the play many, many, many times, you build up a set of moves and ways of doing things. There's an agreed structure, there's an agreed way, an agreed path. But within that, you're, um, you try to keep it alive. Um, and people that are watching your face. If I'm in an audience and I, I watch the person who's not speaking as much as the person who's speaking, because the combination is the story. So, um, yeah, you, uh, I have to, I, I believe I have to have a set of interior responses all the time. I just want to thank you for that final question. We're about to close this. I just want to say some thanks to some people that have been responsible for pulling this together today. Thank you to Daisy, our associate producer here. Thank you to our development team. Thank you to our marketing team. I want to say a huge thanks to each and every one of you for giving up time to coming to support art that is being made here at The Shed. Thank you to each of you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much. Finally, to David, to Nick, to Jamie, to Ray, what an honour it is for us at The Shed to have the opportunity of presenting this work. You have brought something really special to our building. It's an honor to be in service to each of you. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you all very much.